you know, it's just one aspect of a sustainable approach. I hope that this afternoon we can find some more together. Thank you. Does anybody want to say anything before I start, or is everybody still digesting their lunch? I'll take that as a digesting your lunch statement. Okay, so I'm Douglas Harry. I've uh, spent most of my working life as a geography and outdoor education teacher. So I guess I come from an academic background of being interested in things of an environmental nature. Uh, the last nine years I've spent working at the Ministry of Education and the e-learning team. I left the Ministry of Education about a year ago. Uh, but the period from 2002 really until the current time has seen an incredible explosion in things to do with ICT in schools. So I want to use that as a bit of an example, even though I realise that not everybody here is from the school sector, as a, as a proxy for the growth in these things and some of the challenges that we face both in the education sector and wider. So I thought I'd just give you some numbers because one of the things that the New Zealand compulsory education sector has in abundance is large numbers compared to most other sections of government or civil society. So I'll just give you some numbers and we'll use that as a bit of a starting point for thinking about what is the implication of these numbers, both from a philosophical viewpoint, educational viewpoint, economic viewpoint, environmental viewpoint. So in New Zealand, we have about 2,500 schools. And those 2,500 schools have about 750,000 kids in them. And there's about 45,000 teachers. That's in the primary and secondary sector. So when I went to the ministry in 2002, those 2,500 schools, those 750,000 kids, had about 75,000 computers. And we know how many computers are in schools because schools have to report back to the ministry the number of computers they have because we have various software agreements and that's how we pay for those software agreements. So during the time frame from 2000 through to about 2012, those numbers of computers grew from about 75,000 to today around about 200,000. So there's about 200,000 computers in New Zealand schools, give or take a few thousand. And pretty much every teacher in New Zealand, bar about 5,000, has a laptop provided to them basically by the Ministry of Education. So we've seen this incredible growth over that period in the amount of hardware that schools have. <laughs> so schools faced a couple of challenges. One, how do I fund those computers? Because as internet connectivity speeds grew, as broadband went out to schools, as the price of computers went down, as the ability of teachers to use computers in schools grew, the number of computers went up and has just basically kept on going up. So one question I guess we'd be interested in teasing out today is, in the light of schools saying to the ministry, ringing up endlessly and saying, I don't have enough money to buy stuff, the ministry is not giving us enough money to, to buy these things, you know, how should we, how could we fund these things on an ongoing basis? And, and should it be something that the central government does? Should it be something that the schools do? Or some, something between that? So that's one issue. That's the issue of getting the computers. The bigger issue, which is a wider one now, is what do you do with them when you finish using them? So in New Zealand and globally, the whole idea around e-waste, I'm sure that's not an unknown concept to you, is how do, we get, how do we get those computers out of our schools and disposed of properly? I do know a school outside of Wellington where the principal owns a farm and they take the computers to the farm, they've got a big hole there, and they put them in, a, in, in, in that hole and bury them. Now, that's a principle of a primary school doing that. That's not a good thing, I don't need to tell you that, but that is not a good thing to be happening. So, in terms of our sustainability argument, how do we get stuff out of that waste stream? How do we teach our kids those issues? So, one issue, how do we fund them? Another issue is around how, the, how do we then dispose of them? 
another issue that we're facing or the schools have faced over time is who should be looking after those computers when they're in schools. And so in 2005, the ministry carried out a big survey of schools because that was at a time when schools were saying to the ministry, we must have more funding. And so the ministry had a big program to find out how much were schools spending on ICT. And one of the things that came out of that survey was schools have no idea how much they're spending on ICT. Because if you go along to the Minister of Education and say, dear, insert name of minister, we, the ministry, would like an extra $50 million to give you, the schools, the first thing the minister says is, why do you want that money? In the same way that when your kids come to you and say, mum, I need an extra 20 bucks pocket money, you've already given them 20 bucks. The first thing you're gonna to say to them is, why do you need an extra 20 bucks? The problem is when we went out and surveyed schools, we had schools have no idea how much they're spending. And part of the issue is because there is no one definition of what ICT is. So the problem we had in the ministry was if schools don't know how much they're spending on ICT, how can we go along and say to any government, we need more money? So that's a bit of a challenge also. So if you've got some bright ideas around that one, I'm sure there's some people around the room who I can see who would have plenty of ideas about that. So I guess in terms of just setting the scene at the moment, we've got the funding, the, the procurement, and then the disposal of. Because there is now one other tsunami that's coming to schools. And that's the, the, the idea that goes by the name of BYOD, bring your own device. So two years ago, students started turning up at school saying to the principal or to their teacher, do you mind if I bring a device along that I hook onto your network? Now, increasingly, they're turning up and expecting to be able to hook it onto the network, they're not even asking. So, remember, we've got 750,000 kids in schools. We've got schools with roughly 200,000 computers. That gives us half a million-ish kids with no device to use all the time. If we've got environmental issues with the 200,000, what are going to be the issues funding-wise and disposal-wise when kids are turning up with a multiplicity of iPads, Galaxy tabs, other devices that are yet to be invented? So I guess in terms of setting the scene a little bit today, one of the things we'd be interested in, in, in sort of teasing out with you is the funding issue and the e-waste disposal issue. And I think out of those things will come other issues as well. So that's probably a set the scene. Any quick questions or thoughts or additions? I think Absolutely. Testing, one, two. Uh, one, one of the other things that schools need to be aware of when it comes to disposal of computers, and it's not just schools, I think the general public doesn't understand the fact that just deleting a file off a hard drive does not actually get rid of that file. Um, so you actually need to properly format those hard disks because otherwise you're potentially putting um, computers out there to the general public that still could have sensitive student information or financial information. So that's something that you need to be very aware of and you need to make sure that your IT person in your school or your ICT integration company is dealing with that properly when you dispose of those computers? Okay, so that, that's a good point and one that we may well get back to. So I guess that's us setting the scene. Before we sort of get into the meat of it, are there other issues notwithstanding Mike's eloquence on that particular one that people would like to add? Right then. Mr. Siler. I mean, I'm waiting for someone to put up their hand and talk about the professional development or the capability issues. Having sat through an hour of the select committee hearings this morning, you know, almost everybody touches on it. All of us know that becoming more proficient in anything takes time, effort, resource. Whether it's a new skill, it's a new competency. So, you know, 
working with technology, the growing numbers of computers poses a whole issue in the sustainability of the resource it takes to upskill the human element of the system, the teachers, the educators, the managers. There was a time when you could be an educator and never use a computer as an example of technology. And yet that would be difficult in most education organisations today. You may not be on it often, you may not be very proficient, but to say I'm scared of it and won't touch it probably wouldn't get you a job in an interview. And yet if you look at life cycle, you know, sort of total cost of ownership data, the figures are scary when you look at the, the kind of change management of the people. And yet many of you wrestle with this on a daily basis. It's, I don't know, at a gut feel, two, three, four times the other costs put together. So who'd like to start? Um, another uh, sorry. sustained... May I, may I just ask that you say your name and okay. where you're from? It just um, helps some of us tune in. Tara Taylor-Jorgensen from Amesbury School in Wellington. Um, previously at Beds Moon Freight Primary School in Otara. So I've um, spanned the decile 1 to decile 10 divide in one leap. Um, but another sustainability issue, I guess, is uh, teacher workload. Um, now that the, the walls are down and we're um, essentially available to our kids um, up till 10 o'clock at night, um, that's really exciting um, for me at the moment and it's um, quite magic when you're working on a Google Doc and you can see a kid writing at night time. You know, it's a beautiful, amazing thing, but is it sustainable for teachers to be um, keeping those kinds of hours? Um, they, and I, and I love, again, I love it, but they email me during the holidays, they um, instant chat us, um, and I don't want to block that communication because teaching is communicating and establishing relationships with kids. Um, but, you know, where, where do you draw the line and what kind of protection could be available for us in the future or, you know, how is that recognised? Thanks, Tara. Do other people have a perspective on the, on the sort of the sustainability around the hours of work and the quantity or quantum of communication? Actually, I do. Um, I'm on the other end of the transaction. <laughs> as, as Tara, I'm, I'm in high school and my maths teacher, I'm friends with him on Facebook, and he does this thing where he puts all of his, all of his classes online with, uh, with digital blackboards. And he'll, and, and, you know, he, he makes videos and, you know, ex explains everything really simply and stuff. And it's really great, and I can talk to him on Facebook when I don't understand it, and honestly, now I realise that I'm probably just pissing him off a little, but... Uh, <laughs> Um, to answer you, you're not pissing your maths teacher off. He's probably really excited, but it's early days, and you know we've got we've got retirement ages po possibly in our 80s. Um, can we keep that up? That's it's not about the students um, begging for knowledge at all. Hi there, I'm Claire Amos from Epsom Girls Grammar School. Um, one of the ways we're looking to deal with this is um, actually working on a um, digital citizenship resource targeted at staff and giving them guidelines and support about this. And one thing I think we can look at doing as best practice is with these online environments um, and communities that exist 24-7, that we set parameters around when we're there as educators. So I'm a believer of my, I've got a Facebook group for my classes. I have um, my Moodle and my online environments for my classes. I'm available during school hours and maybe short pockets of times beyond school, but to me the real power of those on environments is when the com students are communicating with one another and supporting one another in those environments. And I don't see my place as being there and present online in the evening on a otherwise social networking community. And I, and I think we need to be really careful about setting up best practice policies for our staff that signal when we are available to our students. And it's not about cutting yourself off in terms of your relationships. It's about saying that I have a life as well and I'm also trying to manage my 
time that I'm online. I, you know, one thing that I try and teach my students is keeping a, um, what I refer to as like a, a digital diary and saying how often are you online, how often are you outside running around a field, how often are you having a face-to-face -face conversation with your mum and dad over the dinner table and really keeping those things in check and actually keeping that balance of online life and offline life and, um, and I think we've got to model that as educators. Hmm. I, I know when the Ministry of Education, just while the mic's going, when the, when the Ministry first started rolling out laptops to principals in 2003, there were 13 principals out of 2,500 that refused to have a laptop because they said it's all part of the Ministry's plan to make them work on the weekend. Now, and we said, well, we just assume you're working on the weekend anyway. So, but I think that seriously, that has been an issue. But today, principals don't complain about not having a laptop. They complain that the ministry's laptop only has two gigs of RAM, not four, because now they've sort of moved a long way down over the last sort of seven or eight years. So. Kia ora tato. Um, I'm just going to come from another perspective. Congratulations. Very good presentation there, because that's what has to happen. Um, I'm coming from an education point of view, not a school. And I think we've just gone one leap too far. I don't even have... I have about six computers to about 350 people, children, that I'm educating. So I'd really like to go back to the beginning here and go, how do you obtain the iPad or the Galaxy Pad at a sensible price, because I know schools that are doing it, why aren't we doing it more with a community focus and as educators, full stop? Um, I think it's a key thing purely because we're looking at sustainability here. And if you've got a child, you know, all these people are talking about, oh, my children are all online. Well, these children don't have them. And we were talking about it before, digital divide, digital inclusion, same concepts. We need to get back just for a second. Where are these cheap iPads? Where do we get bulk obtainability? Um, how, because we can formate the community to get the bulk and the money, and it came through with 2020 the other day as well, with the green laptop, no different. It's once again, how do you get that bulk amount of money to provide the actual technology, number one, before we have to sustain it? Hi, I'm... Oh. Hi, I'm Rob. I'm the manager of the Any Question service, which is, for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, is a free online reference service for New Zealand school students. We are funded by the Ministry of Education and our staff comes from libraries around New Zealand. Um, Tara's point earlier about being available online, I've actually seen this with the Any Question service, like I'll be helping a student online doing a transaction and the student will say, oh, hold on, I'll just go check with my teacher what the question is and then they'll come back and say oh yeah this is what was actually meant and we'll help them but my the reason why I wanted to speak up is there is actually a potential model for that way of um, dealing with these trend you know these assisting students outside of normal school hours and that you could have a pool of teachers available who are interested and motivated they're rostered you know they might rostered or whatever they are on they're made available on a night to deal with students um, coming in asking queries around around that particular area. It's quite easy, the software we use is very basic and it could, you know, students come in and, and, and engage with it and it could be that online tutor um, that, you know, it, it is quite easy to do. So that is a, that is a model that could be um, there. Um, something else we're doing with any questions is we've started doing uh, class demonstrations where we demonstrate information literacy to an entire class. The class gets shown it on a data show that then they use it in their own time and that's proved very effective in um, getting you know, teaching students about information literacy and about how to find information and, and tell what appropriate information is out there. So, yeah, anyway. Thank you for that. Just I mean, in the, in the conversations from this part initially, we had ideas coming forward on boundaries and limits that keep yourself you know, sustainable, protect your own time, also resonating over here about a roster, so more efficient and balanced use of time. There's the establishment of methods that are self-supporting for learners, so Claire and others putting in time to set something up that, or to get the momentum that then maintains itself with little adult input 
which is, you know, like the techies group that I established, a very, you know, sensible way. There is a question, you know, sorry, I missed your name. Uh, a question here about where do people get bulk deals? Like what makes a difference in price? That in the room there are people here who have been part of various approaches. They may want to pick up the microphone and address that question. Um, but at the moment there is... Yeah. What a marvellous segue. Okay, um, so yeah, I just wanted to respond to Paula. How do you get these, um, all the devices or technology? Um, Sorry, I'm, I'm Rob. I'm a parent. I uh, also do a bit of work with uh, my local schools that I'm involved with through the kids. And um, one of the major untapped resources I've found in the schools that I go and visit is the group of parents. And a lot of them own businesses. A lot of them are refreshing their technologies for major releases of operating systems. And they come against the same problem of what do they do with the old hardware. Some of it goes on trade me. A lot of it isn't scrubbed. No, so they're giving away their data. But um, a lot of it could come into the schools, and that's something that we've really been trying to push onto the schools that we're involved with is, you know, hey, come to us. We know how to, you know, fry the hard drives and make sure there's nothing on there that can be reused. Use it in the schools, and when you're done with it, if it's not ready for a hole in the ground and the, the back blocks of the of Wellington, then um, we can help you scrub it or we can send you off to RCM who, or any of the other e-waste dealers who will securely dispose of the, the device and um, get rid of the other bits in a uh, eco-friendly manner. Um, it's great to hear that there's some digital citizenry going on and I think modelling that behaviour is really important and that does also come down to these things of what do you do with the devices and how, how do you pa pass them on. Um, yeah, the open source groups are more than willing to help out with a lot of that stuff. Yeah. Janine. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Janina Barbineau, I'm in the ICT department at Maharingi College in Wilkworth. Um, Paul, specifically for you, is there the bulk buying issue for the schools? You've got 2,500 schools. That's a huge pool of bulk buying power. Why is every school organizing its own buying, almost in competition with one another? Where, where does that, when does that power become consolidated and used to the benefit of the schools? So we, you would know more. You've been involved with this for for years, is there a group out there? And if not, why don't we get that started? I know Nat said we're not supposed to have de deliverables from today, but I never listened to him. <laughs> I mean, I'll share a perspective. I do know that I tried hard when in the Ministry of Education and part of negotiating the purchase agreement for our own corporate procurement that a clause went in that schools could purchase the same types of hardware as the Ministry used at the same prices and nobody in the organisation wanted to run with the transaction cost of that. I thought it was quite an efficient gain to the system. No one was compelled. It didn't take a lot more time in head office to do, and you just write a clause in a contract. Time's moved on, and at least state and state integrated schools are able to participate in all of government procurement if that's desirable. And I say that last clause not to be cheeky, but because some schools have looked at it really seriously, have said it doesn't meet our needs, or the price is not actually as good as it seems, or buying hardware in that manner to get a discount restricts our ability to do other dealings outside of that channel. Now, I haven't looked at it myself. These are people I respect. There may be others here who've unpacked that either as part of their local you know, community, their single institution, or a wider group. Do people want to share? Uh, one of the problems with bulk procurement on that scale is that none of the ICT managers from schools agree it, as to a standard PC. And even just the divide between uh, Apple and PC immediately dilutes your buying power. So the, to be effective, the ministry would need to move to a mandated PC for schools, which I don't think is going to be the answer. Hi. Apologies, I didn't introduce myself earlier. My name is Mike Hilliard. I'm with the Greater Christchurch Schools Network Trust. Um, one of the things that we undertake on behalf of schools in Christchurch is we look at helping them procure services and products. 
Um, to give you an example, we just um, purchased and um, installed wireless equipment in 11 schools in East Christchurch um, with some funding that we received because there were schools that had been particularly hard hit by the um, natural disasters in, a, in Christchurch. Um, we managed to procure a very good price. Um, and so it is possible to do this. The one thing I will say, um, for those of you who um, are not aware of this, forget getting any discount on Apple products. It doesn't happen. They don't discount for anybody. So um, as far as you know, laptops, notebooks, netbooks, I mean, um, um, LAN hardware, wireless equipment, that's all achievable, but what it means is that you actually do need to start schools within a community or within an area, need to actually start working together cooperatively to make that happen. Um, and I suppose to a certain degree that's easier said than done, but it can be achieved, um, as we've seen in various areas around the country. Um, so that's, I suppose, really all I have to say. It is achievable, but schools need to start working together. Um, can they depend on the ministry to do that for them? Um, no. Um, so you need to take that tiger by the tail yourself. Go out and start talking to schools within your community and within your area and say, hey, let's get together. The other thing I can suggest um, is that you need to start making informed buying decisions because I've seen a lot of schools that have spent money that they've six months or 12 months later had to go out and spend more money because they didn't make a good decision in the first place. The easiest way to make those informed buying decisions is to actually get expert advice. It may cost you a little bit upfront, um, but in the long run, it is most likely going to save you large amounts of money. So. Get the experts to help you. And by experts, I don't mean the first salesman that walks through your door from your local IT company. Those are not the people you want to be taking buying advice from. Thank you. So just in the sedgeway here, there's some ideas about collaborating or aggregating demand would be what I'd call it. But it comes at the transaction cost of getting agreement. And who anyone who's tried to get even two individuals, let alone two institutions, to agree about purchasing the same product or service on the same terms, there's a cost involved in getting that agreement, and sometimes it is not worth the saving that's gained. The successful schemes that I've seen that don't have a, an entity like a, a, a local network or trust to run are one school needs to purchase something establishes a clause where others can buy in within a period and leaves it open. In other words, the deal wasn't predicated on a critical number, but the successful supplier took a gamble that there would be more units sold, whatever the item or the services, and offered a better price. But if it's invitational and optional, you're not carrying a financial risk as being the early mover, and neither are you incurring the cost of getting agreement before you start. It's probably the last thing I'd say, there's more I would say there is more money to be saved and therefore greater gain out of shared services than there is out of hardware. The margins in hardware, while we naively, I may think, they're a lot, they're often much less than in services. While Apple may not negotiate even for a group of schools, we do know that the price of hardware in real terms is falling naturally. And you might want to look at where the spend goes. If you have evidence from your tertiary organisation, your early childhood association, of where the spend is on ICT, then you may be able to establish where the rich pickings are for savings. Hi. Thanks. Um, Sue Davidson. <coughs> Sorry, Computers and Homes in Christchurch. Um, I also have an education background. So um, it just exactly what you were saying, I was just going to say... Um, the cost of devices has certainly come down. You know, in the last 10 years, when you were trying to put computers into schools, it was costing, you know, now it's probably a third of the cost to do the same sort of thing, the little devices. Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering, what do people think about getting your local businesses involved and, you know, getting them to sponsor the school and putting a bit of advertising up for them? A lot of this has happened around Christchurch because we've had to help each other. 
you know, it's, it's just a natural fact of what's happened down there. And so people are getting involved with each other, businesses are helping out schools, that sort of thing. And I'm just thinking maybe it is an avenue that people could look into a little bit more to get a bit more financial support from the local businesses. Good afternoon, Diana Ayling from uh, Unitech Institute of Technology in Auckland. I just want to respond to our teachers that spoke earlier about um, the amount of time they were spending um, answering student queries. Just going to shift the conversation slightly. How would you like to do your professional development? Are you interested in being part of communities, uh, national, uh, large communities that are involved in teacher upskilling, or would you prefer to be in smaller um, groups of teachers in your geographical area, which are willing to be online at 8 o'clock at night, learning uh, a little bit more about um, how to engage with enhanced learning. Just really interested to hear from the teachers in the room what kind of professional development they would like and how they would see it as being sustainable. Hi, Helena Mill from um, AUT University. Um, Something that hasn't been mentioned yet um, is we put all this technology in schools. Um, what sort of support is there to go around, um, to wrap around that technology? Because sometimes it doesn't always work first time. Generally, when I speak, she'll speak <laughs> straight after. Um, just want to mention two things, um, respond to you and um, re-bring up e-waste. Um, being from having a decile one background, um, with the best intentions, please don't dump your old computers onto our schools. Um, even if you strip it off and put open source on it um, for licensing reasons, that's also very cool, but at the end of the day, they only last about a year and a half, and then we're stuck with the e-waste. And um, it, it, I had an experience where it actually worked out very well for me because we were surrounded by computers. Our art room was filled with useless computers. Um, every resource space was filled with a broken printer or a you know huge, um, dangerous CRT monitors and, you know, just awful. Um, we actually turned it into a class inquiry and my class managed to get Hewlett Packard to come and take it all away, which was absolutely fantastic. Um, and this was about three or four years ago. When they Googled e-waste, it didn't even come up with any hits. Um, and they also then discovered e-days. And um, that's another thing you can do in schools is save up your waste and you can dispose of them safely um, every year. Um, but in saying that, we, they also did quite a lot of research into that and where they go, even after we dispose of them safely, is quite questionable as well. And they saw quite disturbing videos of children in other countries soldering off um, copper and, and their eyes burning. And you know, it, So it's, it really is a um, big, huge issue. Um, so. You know, if you do have an old computer, do think twice about donating it to a school because quite often it's actually not that kind. Um, and then to respond to your question, and then Claire will um, say it much more eloquently, but um, we do, I, I do a lot of professional development on my own. Um, at night, I use uh, Wiki Educator, um, I um, take part in online courses. Um, and, but the best professional development I've ever had was Ignition which is a group of um, teachers who run professional development for themselves with the motto, the answers are in the room. Um, and then Claire will talk to you more about um, actual in-house PD. Is that where you'll go? Yeah. Yeah. Um, th and this, this actually really hits on the, the topic of sustainability, because I believe if you want sustainable change within schools, your professional development should be led from within the school. Um, but there's certain things that need to be put in place to make that possible. There's a combination of needing time within a school day, within a frame that, um, that gives teachers opportunities to 
receive professional development. There also needs to be a level of expertise within school. One thing that I um, talked about earlier today was I think we need to really look at how we're providing that within school structures. For instance, in a secondary school, we have something called a secondary, I mean, sorry, a specialist classroom teacher, which I think has become to an extent outdated and we need to review things like that and how we can provide um, either full-time or part-time support within school. I honestly believe the best way to deliver professional development is by using a teaching as inquiry model or framework, which actually means that it's put in the context of meeting your very specific community and school and student needs, and that it's about doing an inquiry about what is it that you want your students to learn or to know, and then to investigate the e-learning tools or strategies that will best um, support that learning, and then make sure that you're actually critically reflecting on whether it did actually make a difference. But for this to happen, you can't just say, go off, do teaching as inquiry. You need to give staff time and support and guidance. But if you can get that happening within a school, I honestly believe it's the way to sustain very genuine, contextualised change that will make a difference in the classroom. Thanks, Claire. Bon. Yeah, just a couple of quick points. Um, <clears throat> on the local business thing, Sponsoring schools, and you know, a lot of us do do that. I guess um, the flip side of that point is, uh, what if Philip Morris is your local business? Um, but the the main point I want to make and is to speak for a small school uh, north of Dunedin called Warrington School, which is a K-12 school, has 50 students. They do take second-hand computers, as do actually quite a few schools, because a lot of corporates uh, have a three-year life for their computers, sometimes less. And those computers actually themselves have at least another three years on top of that. So um, what that school does is it, it takes uh, the computers, it puts um, Ubuntu on there. The kids, um, they can break them, they can put spare parts in them. And as a result of their experience, they actually build computers for their community that they work in as well. They also use that sort of software platform to run a local radio station. And uh, they use Creative Commons music to, as, as a broadcasting music type thing. So um, there is, a, a, I guess, a sort of hacker culture being built up in that school. And, and I know that there are children of that school that in 10 or 15 years' time I want working in my company because they have that culture. And, and the next step of that that I see for education in New Zealand in that sort of sphere, not for the overall thing, is in initiatives like the Raspberry Pi where you effectively are getting a computer for 25 bucks. That's a really, really exciting thing, I think, for, for those of us that are looking to get technologists out of the education sector, which I do admit is a small group. Um, I've got... I'd like to reinforce what Claire said about the inquiry-based learning in the classroom. Those are some of my best experiences. I, Richard, I work at the Correspondence School at the moment. Um, and I'd reinforce what she said because I've had some fantastic experiences. That have, it might have been an outside facilitator who's come in and facilitated the school-wide learning or different models, but that type of process is excellent. I'd also like to draw on where you're coming from. Um, the first part of my teaching career was in small country schools in Taranaki. And when I moved to teach in city schools in Wellington, the difference in school culture, to me, really set me back. In the little country school, what might be two, three teacher, one teacher, it's the parents who own the school. The parents will bring in the um, trailer load of firewood being towed by their John Deere tractor for the year's firewood for the um, school wood burners. Um, the manager of the um, school assets would come in and uh, with some of the other people and build the adventure playground themselves. And so it was the teachers who were the transients who moved through the school. And, that, and when I work, started working in the city schools, <coughs> parents were hesitant even to look into the staff room. 
and it was not inclusive of parents in the same way as I'd experienced in the little country schools. And I think that's a challenge for larger schools and secondary schools also. Hi, um, I'm the token Australian in the room. I'm not an educator, but on behalf of all the other non-educators, I'd like to say thank you to all of you. I value professional educators higher than the computers by far. Uh, if there were no computers, you would do your job. You might even do it better, and I say that as a 30-year IT person, but I, I value you all immensely. To, are you men from the ministry or men ex from the ministry? <laughs> Right, because you didn't, you didn't want a deliverable, but the kind of mood I sense in here is if you're going to use an acronym like TCO, and it's a great acronym, the total cost is clearly a lot bigger than the life cycle of the box. It's the training investment in the staff, and it's the support investment. And education departments are kind of low down the pecking order. I mean, it's the big budget item on the election year, but Treasury generally is the one that makes the rules. So if you have to fight for a funding round that encapsulates TCO for these staff, these wonderful people, to get them trained up to use the resource and the replacement cycles and the purchasing cycles, that's a big ask. But that's a big deliverable. So I, I think the sense here is TCO is an all-encompassing phrase that covers a lot of things, and it's going to be a long fight, but it's probably worth it. to know what, what you wrestle with, how you, how you meet needs. I don't think mine are met very well as a parent of a four-year-old, and I've shared that with the association. Just, just a, another question for those who might want to share. Um, Lisa Benson, also at Amesbury School. This is kind of relevant to um, early childhood. Um, we have a... Um, an early childhood centre I know of who's been trying to move into a digital environment and so your beautiful portfolios that your little early childhood uh, children get with, you know, flip through everything and they're gorgeous, they're lovely. Um, they've tried to move that into a digital platform and the way they've done that though is they've brought in iPads and different devices to view that on but they're too scared to leave that out so that gets hidden away. You've actually taken away some of their access, which is quite an interesting um, problem for them to wrestle with because beforehand you'd have all of these uh, portfolios visible all the time. The children, the parents, everyone can kind of flick through it and as soon as it's become digital, it's become a bit more precious. Mm. And so sometimes it's not, it's not the device, it's not the IT, it's the attitudes around that because um, I, I teach with five-year-olds and not one of my five-year-olds have ever broken or damaged any device, and it's. But sometimes it's just that 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 you you don't want to trust that these small little people are actually quite capable. So that's just some things that I've just noticed. Yeah, thank you. I do know I have some gasps of breath as my four-year-old plays with my expensive phone, but the reality is he hasn't dropped it yet, and I do drop it probably once a fortnight. <laughs> Hi. Um, I first came to New Zealand to study Steiner education. I don't know if any of you have heard of it, but it's a very holistic approach to educating kids from zero to supposedly 18, but it goes beyond. And um, there's, how do you say, an orthodox idea. I don't know if it still exists because I'm not working in the community right now, that Computers and the virtual world is demonic. <laughs> but apart from that, um, that kids are exposed to TV and computers perhaps when they're ready. So that's one idea. I'd like to share a few anecdotes, if I may. Another idea is that um, it's, it's about wise use, depending on whether you're ready for it, instead of pushing children or even adults into using computers, because I used to teach art in Singapore, and Singapore has a whole different emphasis on um, political integration in education, as well as how you fund and how you dispose of and how do you distribute across schools. 
and my experience of um, use, having, being forced to use IT to teach art was a difficult one because as a beginner teacher in Singapore, um, the first school I taught at, the school really wanted to distinguish itself in digital arts and expected me to completely take on, as a solo teacher, a solo art teacher in that school, to take the whole task of training my students by upskilling myself, as well as managing the digital lab, as well as creating a whole art IT program which hadn't been there before. So on the one hand, from top down, there was an idea of teach less, learn more, which is a neoliberal idea of how can we do more out of our teachers than we have with less. Um, but out of that, Thank I had you. to... I probably need to just wrap up. Oh, okay. Sorry, so I'll give you a moment to wrap up your comment. Right. So really, if you look at sustainability, economically, the state took care of everything. And when it came to environmental issues of how do you take care of those um, disposal ideas, um, there was an IT specialist in the school who took care of all of those things. And when it came to the social, I believe the teacher is what keeps the fabric of the classroom together. And the spirit of that comes before the, ice, before the equipment. And finally, how... Thank, thank you. I, I need to stop there. Okay. okay. Thank you. Because we are, we are at our time. Thank you for sharing your perspectives. There's a lot of experience in the room here. There's different approaches. And you know, the challenge to all of us is to find an approach that's appropriate to the problems we face and the context that we're within. Take the opportunity to connect you know, verbally with some of the people here if you want to learn more about what they're putting forward or find them virtually online if you have a handle of some sort. It's not my intention to sum up or to list what you've heard, but I hope that you have learned something from somebody else here, either about an aspect of the problem of sustainability that you didn't appreciate before, as I have today, or about aspects of the solution or approaches to a solution that you hadn't thought of before. So from me, thank you for participating. It's been good to have your contributions.